It's an age-old question. Is the pitcher half full or half empty? Now, based on your outlook on life, you could answer that question one of two ways. It may be that you see this as being half full. And research would suggest that you're more of an optimist. You see more good things than you do bad things generally. And so you, you have a more positive outlook on life. And yet if you see this picture as more empty, you may, you may be a little bit more pessimistic on the scale. And you may see things a little more, a little more negatively than, than you otherwise might. So this is the age-old question of whether or not something is half full or half empty. And this morning, what we're going to see is that how you would answer that question could have implications on your life. It could have implications on how you experience things, how you see things, and how you deal with things. So this morning we are wrapping up. It's all about love. We've looked at the book of 1 John, and today we're going to squeeze Second and Third John together, and we're not going to cover all of them, but they'll be available in your Bible apps for you throughout the week if you want to cover the verses that we miss. Uh, and if you have your phones or your tablets, you can follow along with us there today. And if not, it'll be available on the screen as we're going to read some selections of Second John and Third John. And what you need to know about Second John is it's a follow-up to First John, right? Even, even, when John was, even when the Spirit of God was using John to write Scripture, this idea of a sequel was prevalent. And so Second John is the sequel to First John. And he wrote this, he wrote this book to a, to a certain individual, to a lady. Now, we don't know who, uh, but to a lady in the church that he, was, that he had a fondness for. And that's not to insinuate a romantic relationship, but he had a fondness for this woman in the church. And so he, he wrote this letter addressed to her. And we're going to dive in this morning. At verse 4, we read this. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth just as we were commanded by the Father. And what we see here from this approach is we see how incredibly optimistic John was. That he looks at the situation and he's excited that some of this woman's children were doing what they were supposed to be doing. He looks at the situation and he's excited that some of the kids are doing what they should be doing and they're following God. That's his approach, that he's excited about this. Now, I generally don't walk through life that way. I'm wired very differently. My idea on the surface level, my natural instinct is very simply this. You don't reward somebody or get excited over something when somebody's just doing what they should be doing. That's just, the, that's just the way I'm wired. You can call me old school. I, I've got the mentality of a football coach that I carry uh, with me through a lot of different things. And that's, I don't celebrate the things that, that people just should be doing. I'm just like, no, that's what you're supposed to be doing. But if I'm not careful and if I don't temper that, what can happen is that can lead me to more of a pessimistic outlook on things. I, I love... I love the coaching of Bill Belichick. I'm not a Patriots fan by any stretch of the imagination, but when you look at the success that that man has had, and it all started with a horrible stretch with my Cleveland Browns back in the 90s, and then when that ended unsuccessfully, then he went to the Patriots and has revolutionized the game of football. And just really when you think of the most successful coaches ever to be in the NFL, Bill Belichick is, is in that equation. One of the things that cracks me up about Bill Belichick is after games when either the team has had a really good performance or they've had a really bad performance and he doesn't want to talk about it, is they'll start, the reporters will ask him questions and he really doesn't like to do the whole news conference thing. And so one of the answers that'll give him is, we're on to our next opponent. We're on to our next opponent. Hey, Bill, you won by 35 points today against the Jets. How do you feel? We're on to our next opponent. We're on to our next opponent. And we can walk through life with the mentality right, of a football coach, especially for, for you who trend like I do, a little bit more pessimistic on the scale. And what's dangerous about that is we don't take the time to celebrate wins. We don't take time to celebrate wins. And we're moving so quickly and we're on to the next thing that we never take the time to really sit back and appreciate what's been accomplished and appreciate all that God has done. We're just on to the next challenge, which in some cases can be a wonderful asset because we, we get things done. 
and we're, we're on to the next thing. And yet, on the other hand, can be incredibly exhausting when you have a team around you, when you have a spouse near you, when you have friends in the picture, when you have people who love you, who are working beside you. If you are not intentional about taking the time to set back and celebrate wins, you can burn everybody out around you. And so it's important that if you, if you align in a way very similar to the way that I align, that you identify that and you put some safeguards in place. That even if you feel like, well, this is a waste of time or this isn't something that really speaks my language or something that I really value, you put in place anyways because you have to understand that not everybody is wired like you are. And so if you are wired more on the pessimistic side of things and you work with a team of people, then you need to put in your calendar, we are going to, whether it's once a week, whether it's once a month or once a quarter, we are going to celebrate some accomplishments. We are going to celebrate what has, what has happened. And you might feel like, well, that means I'm going to have to celebrate some things I don't really want to celebrate because people are just doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if you have that mindset, I totally get it, but we need to see things more like John sees things here. Because here's the flip side of this coin. He rejoices greatly in the fact that some of her kids are following after Jesus. But you know what that means? The other side of the coin means that there's some who aren't. There's some who aren't. And rather than focus just on those who aren't, He takes the time to focus on those who are. And he sees the good, and he sees the positive in it. And so I just want to challenge you, if your outlook is all all challenge and on to the next thing, you have to take some time to see the good. And you have to really put in Put in place some things that you might not like naturally, and they're not going to come easily to you, but for the sake of everybody that's around you, put them into place and celebrate things that you feel like, I don't really want to celebrate. I don't really feel like this is a good use of my time, because it might not mean much to you, but it means the world to people around you who are wired differently than you are. And it will lead to more sustainability on your teams. It will lead to better morale. You have to take that time if you're not wired that way. Just here, as John doesn't focus on all the people who aren't doing what they should be doing, but instead focuses on those who are doing what they should be doing. And here's another side of this coin that, that I want to talk to talk to parents specifically you might find yourself in this situation. You might have kids who who are grown and who are following Jesus and who love God and who are doing everything that, that they should be doing, and that is cause for celebration. But on the flip side, you might have kids who are distant. And you might have kids that every time you think about them, as you walk the hall of your house, you see that picture from years ago, with a smile on their face, and you would give anything just to get back to those days. Just to see that smile once more. You would give anything to intervene in their life and to make different choices for them. And you see the choices that they're making, and it absolutely tears you apart, and it absolutely breaks your heart, because you love God, and you follow Jesus, and your greatest desire for your kids was that they would love God, and that they would follow Jesus, and right now, they don't. And it's causing you anguish, and it just tears you apart because you see somebody who just needs peace and hope and love so desperately, and yet for whatever reason, they refuse. Deep in your heart, there's blame, and there's bitterness, and there's resentment. And it's directed at you. And you feel like, if only I would have done this differently. If only I could go back and change this. If only I would have, if only I didn't. And you will tear yourself apart as you play the what if game. And you sit there and you just rack your mind trying to figure out what is it that you did that pushed them away. 
So I just want to encourage you this morning to stop blaming yourself. Could you have done some things better? Absolutely. We're all human. We all can. In every situation that we face, we could go back and do things differently. We could go back and do things better. Did you slip up somewhere along the way? Yes. Is their course of life your fault? No. We are all individuals. And this is something that's so incredible about the love of God, that in the love of God, he has given us the capacity to choose the path of whether or not we are going to reciprocate the love that God has sent our way. And he's given us the ability to choose. He's given us the ability to choose, but that means he's also given our kids the ability to choose. And when they're two or they're three, it's really not a hard choice. But when they become 13 and 14, the choices get a lot harder. And then when they're 23 or they're 24, the choices are up to them. And so parents, stop beating yourselves up. Let go of the guilt. It's not your fault. You could have done things differently. But they are responsible for the choices that they make. And so if you find yourself there, then you need to be praying for your kids like crazy. But you need to let go of the guilt that you have put upon yourself. And let's make sure that if you find yourself in that boat, especially with some kids who are following Jesus and others who aren't, don't just allow the anguish of the kids who aren't following Jesus to override everything else. But make sure that you rejoice in the fact that some are as well. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Love is living according to what God has called us to do. Love is living according to what God has called us to do. That is how we know whether or not we have accepted the virtue of love, whether or not we live according to what God has called us to do. It's all about love. And here's the deal. Actions speak louder than words. Your actions will speak louder than your words. It's easy to proclaim that you love God. It's hard to live accordingly. It's easy to say that you love God. It's hard to live accordingly. Just as in any relationship that you're in, it's easy just to throw off a, I love you. But it's hard to actually live up to that when it causes sacrifice, when it causes us to throw aside the things that we really want to do. It's easy to say, but it's hard to do. And the longer you're with something, the harder and harder it can be. So let's make sure that our actions match our words. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for. But many will win a full reward. But may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Listen, don't entertain those who are hostile to Jesus. Don't entertain those who are actively hostile to Jesus. And so this, is, this can be a trap for people who mean really well and who have a desire to see people come to know Jesus. And so what happens is you can find yourself engaged in a hostile environment where you're trying to argue people to Jesus. And you're trying to, you're trying to debate people into becoming followers of Christ. And so this can happen on social media platforms. It can happen in a number of outlets. But you find yourself surrounded by people who are actively hostile to Jesus. And you are trying, you are trying actively to win them to Jesus. Listen, don't engage in destructive debates. Don't engage in destructive debates. 
You, it's not your job to save anyone. It's not your job to save anyone. What is our obligation? Our obligation is to point people to Jesus. Our obligation is to express to people the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. Our obligation is to demonstrate the love that, that God has shown to us. Our obligation is to live our lives according to the love that we have received. Our obligation is to become more and more like Jesus. Our obligation is not to win an argument at all. We can't in our power save anybody. And so just stop trying. What we can do is point people to God, but then let God take over from there and let him do the rest. Don't sacrifice your reputation because you find yourself engaged in an argument, engaged in a battle with somebody who is actively hostile to the things that you believe. You're just going to come out looking dirty. So just don't. Don't engage with people who are actively hostile. And let go of any guilt that you might feel where you feel like, well, I'm not doing enough. It's not your job to save anyone. So now we're going to look at a couple portions of 3 John. And 3 John was written to a gentleman named Gaius. Now, Gaius was an elder in the church. And so this is what we find there when we dive in at verse 5. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. And so we just saw the people that we aren't to engage and that we aren't to support and that we aren't to entertain. So now we see the people that we are to engage and we are to support and we are to entertain. And that is others who follow Jesus. We're to engage and support in one another's lives. We're to cheer one another on. We're to celebrate the victories. We're to push each other. We are to be engaged in relationships with one another. Engage and support others who follow Jesus. The reality is we need one another. None of us are called to go through life alone. We all need each other. And so in January, you're going to see some signups around here. And the signups are going to be for small groups in which you can become engaged with a group of people who, who will love you, who will value you, who will support you, who will cheer you on, who will encourage you, who will pray for you, who will walk through life together with you. And this coming spring, we're going to be looking at a, at a Bob Goff book, Love Does. And so we want you to come and be a part because everybody needs somebody else. And those signups don't start until January. So start looking at your schedule now and be thinking about when would work for you, what night would work for you. Be thinking about if you want to lead a discussion group of this incredible book. But it's coming up in January. But the reality is we need each other. We all need each people in our lives who encourage us and who support us, who want to see the best for us, who pray for us, who challenge us, and who we know we can count on, that we will celebrate with, and that when we're walking through the valley, will help us take another step. Now, I've written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, and not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Now, with a name like Diotrephes, you're just destined to be trouble, all right? You're just, you're just set up from birth that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a hard road to walk in life. And so here is Diotrephes, and he's a guy with an agenda. He's a guy who has an agenda. And every church that's ever existed has had this at one point or another in their existence. It's a person with an agenda. And so here's Diotrephes, and he has an agenda. And what's his agenda? Himself. As often the times it is with people who go in and want to bring up dissension, 
as people who go in and want to cause all kinds of trouble, not always, but oftentimes the case is that they want to put themselves in the spotlight. They want to be the focal point. They want to be the, the source of all the attention. And that is the case here with Diotrephes. He is a guy with an agenda. And oh, by the way, he's, he's lobbing allegations that John calls wicked nonsense. He's saying things about John and others that simply aren't true. Why? Because he has an agenda that doesn't fall in line with John's agenda. And so since his agenda doesn't fall in line with John's agenda, one of the things he wants to do is take him out so that his agenda himself can be... Can be allowed to reign free. And he can elevate himself if he gets John and others who follow the agenda out of the way. And so what's he do? He starts to lie about them. He starts to accuse them of things. And he lobs allegation after allegation their way. Like I said, here's the reality. At some point in time, you face this in your life. Whether it's a coworker, whether it was a classmate in school, whether it's a family member, there is somebody who is jealous of you in a scenario or a situation or wants something that you have that they don't have or just wants to knock you down a little bit because they sense that you're experiencing too much success or things are going too well for you, whatever their motive may be, you've experienced this. You've experienced the politicking. You've experienced the behind the scenes. You've been on the receiving end of people saying things about you that simply are not true. And what can be paralyzing is when you find your self-worth based on what everybody says, thinks, and feels about you. Because suddenly, if you're basing all of your self-worth in what everybody else says and feels and thinks about you, and now you have this, this person here who is actively trying to take you down and is willing to lie about you in order to do so, I promise you this, they have an audience because people love to hear gossip. And then that sows a seed in somebody else's mind. And if your entire self-worth is based entirely on what everybody else thinks and feels about you, then you are going to constantly be in a state of insecurity. And you will never reach your full potential because you will constantly be worried about what somebody thinks and says and feels about you. I heard somebody say one time, when I was 15 to 25, I cared what everybody thought about me. When I was 25 to 35, I just arrived at the fact that I didn't care at all what anybody thought about me, and I'm just going to do whatever I want. And then when I was 35, I finally realized nobody's thinking about me. If your self-worth is all based and wrapped in what everybody else thinks and says about you, you're never going to be secure. And so I wonder, how do we derive our identity? Do we feel secure? Are we people who walk through life not in a state of constant insecurity and all of the, all the anxiety that that brings? Have we reached the point where we're really fully ready to embrace that we are who God has made us to be and that there are going to be people for whatever reason, whether it's their agenda, whether it's they just don't like us because of something that we said or did that they interpreted wrong or something we said and did that was wrong on that day and they haven't come to us and we haven't had an opportunity to hash it out like we should and to allow forgiveness and restoration to take place or they just woke up in a really bad mood and decided that they don't like us today. But ha are we people who allows what everybody else thinks and feels and says about us to dictate how we feel about ourselves? 
Or are we people who understand that God has created us and wired us and designed us in a certain way? And yes, we have flaws and yes, we need to grow. But ultimately, we can be safe and we can be secure and the people we are because we are designed by God. That is the path to walking through life in a secure fashion and not having to go through life in a constant state of insecurity where we're always worried about everybody else and their perspective of us. Because I can promise you this, someone somewhere does not like you. And for some of us, like myself, that's singular. Now for other people... (laughs) I kid, I kid. For others of us, like myself, man, there's a whole host of people out there that do not like us. And it doesn't mean you walk through life like ready to give everybody the finger, but what it does mean is you go through life with a confidence, understanding that what you feel about me doesn't dictate and determine how I feel about myself because I understand that at the core, I am designed by God and one day I will give an account before God and I will give an answer and I fall short all the time and I make mistakes, but I am who God has made me to be and I am trying my best best to become more like him. And if you don't like that, you don't matter to me. Go find people that you do like. And so I'm just challenging you. Not everyone is going to like you. Not everybody is going to love you. If you can fix that in a situation, then you go meet with that person and you fix it and you give it your best. But in the words of Taylor Swift, haters going to hate. So just let them go. Let them go. You can do the right thing and still face opposition. You do the right thing and you will face opposition. So be ready for it. And don't allow it to destroy you. You can't allow what what everyone thinks about you to determine your self-worth. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. Do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Lakeside, it's all about love. Two weeks ago, we let you know of opportunities that we face every year to help people as they go through situations that we wouldn't wish on people. The loss of a job, death of family members, the strains of a broken marriage, the struggles of sick children, the incapacitating of an illness. And when those hard times come, people reach out. Are there some who scam the system? Absolutely, but we do our best to weed them out. And so there's a process, and we do turn people down, unapologetically so. Because we believe that we will give an account for every single penny that you have entrusted us with to manage, because we understand that it's really not even your money. It's God's money. And we're all just stewarding it. Check this out. Two weeks ago, Lakeside, you entrusted us to help people in hard times with $7,545.27. Yeah. Give it up. It's all about love. But here's the deal. In some respects, it's easy to rally around a project. And it's easy when our focus is is 
is directed on one thing, and we're so excited. We are so excited about this amount. We're so excited not, just, excited not just because of the amount, but because of the stories that it represents and the people that it allows us to share the love of Jesus with. That's why we're excited. But here's the deal. We don't just get to give one time and think we're done. Because what's the test of love? we follow God and we obey his commands, that we do good, that we are people who elevate the needs and desires of our neighbors before our own, that we are people who go and who sacrifice financially, who sacrifice of our time to go make a difference in other people's lives, that we are people who when people say things against us that are inaccurate, we don't harbor the grudge and we forgive the person and we actively strive to have restoration take place so that we can repair the relationship. We love by giving to the least of these. We love by forgiving. We love by giving. We love by sacrificing. And we love by pointing to Jesus so that everyone we encounter we can show the love of God too. But the most effective point that we can do is our lives and how we live. Actions speak louder than words. From your actions two weeks ago, we are off to a great start. But don't quit. And don't think the work's done. Because we're just getting started. And we hope you are too. God, I pray that in our lives individually, people will see it's all about love. Because it's all about you. Then when people look at us, they would see a result of changed people. That we would be quick to tell of the transformation that you've made. And the hope that we have as a result of what you've done for us. God, I, I just want to pray for, for the person here that struggles to see the positive. And Lord, I just pray that right now they, you would just work on their hearts and you would just... You would just unveil things to them right now, God, that would make it so obvious. And God, that they would intentionally set up a time this week to just celebrate some of your goodness and celebrate some of what you've done. I pray, God, for the parent in here whose heart breaks every single morning because the kid they love so much so far from you. God, I pray that you would release any guilt that they're carrying. That they would confess their missteps to you, but then, God, that they would pray like crazy for their kid. And God, I pray that you would work in the hearts of their kids. Let them stop beating themselves up. God, I pray that as we face opposition personally and collectively here at Lakeside, that we would be people of grace. That our first goal would be restoration and conversation that could lead to forgiveness and clarity. But Lord, when that doesn't work, that we wouldn't become paralyzed and accomplish nothing but we would be secure enough to know that ultimately we have to give an account to you and no one else. And God, I pray that we would do good and we would imitate good 
in our lives and point people to you. In your son Jesus' name we pray.